So the next speaker is uh, Professor Shetab Roshinha. He's one of our own. He is a, a professor at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. He is part, uh, he, he does physics and computational biology. He obtained his PhD from the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta and subsequently spent time at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and at Cornell University. He has been at uh, IMSC since 2002. He works in very interesting problems. Uh, he works on things ranging from heart attacks to the Indus Valley script, all kinds of very interesting problems that uh, where mathematics can help or an approach based on mathematics can help. So he will tell us today about the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Thanks. Thanks, Ganesh. So uh, let me begin by thanking Raghavan and Gautam, my colleagues at the Institute, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to especially follow on on this great set of speakers who have actually made my job easier for me because they've already given you a taste of what complex systems are, what I'm going to talk about. So let me begin by stealing a story from one of my favorite writers, Douglas Adams. So if any of you have read the book or seen the movie Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy, you would of course know what I'm talking about. For those unfortunate souls who have not yet had the fortune of being introduced to Douglas Adams, the story goes like this. In some far distant future, humans decide to figure out once and for all the answer to this ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So in the spirit of what Vijay just spoke about, they built a quantum computer which has the sole purpose of answering this question, and with great hubris, they call it deep thought. So deep thought takes centuries to build. Presumably, they require super twisted electrons. Ultimately, one day it's built. And then someone throws a switch, and it starts computing. It starts computing, and it computes and computes and computes. Centuries go about. Governments fall, countries fall, but deep thought is just computing. Eventually the day comes when deep thought announces the answer is at hand. And so with great anticipation, the world awaits this answer. So deep thought declares the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is, 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 is 42. Which, of course, raises the question, what's the question? Without context, the answer is meaningless. Right? Now, Douglas Adams was basically poking fun at this human desire to reduce everything to a simple, pithy answer. And he was saying, the question is just important as the answer. Without the context, the answer simply won't make sense. So whenever we physicists get this desire to come up with the ultimate theory of everything, we should keep in mind Douglas Adams' cautionary tale. And yet, despite this, we have Nevertheless, attempts at coming up with precisely those kinds of theories of everything. As Richard Feynman, whom Vijay mentioned, once famously said, wouldn't we all love to have a simple, pithy equation, something that you can hopefully put on your t-shirt, which we say answers everything about the universe? Everybody knows who this is. This is Stephen Hawking, one of the most well-known theoretical physicists of the past few decades. Now, typical of his you know, extremely provocative kind of scientific personality, when in 1980, he was elected the Vacation Professor of Mathematics, he started his inaugural lecture with this very provocative title, is the end of theoretical physics in sight. And with a characteristic lack of humility, he said yes. Within our own lifetimes, we will come up 
with a unified understanding of all the fundamental laws which govern matter, interaction of matter, and that will be the end of physics as we know it. So let me ask you a countering question. Even if we do find a theory of everything, does it really mean we know everything? Does it really mean the end of science? The answer, of course, has to be no, right? The way I'm setting you up. So let me give you a counter example. A toy system called the game of life, where we know the theory of everything, and we still can't answer most questions about it. So this game was devised by the Princeton mathematician John Houghton Conway back in 1970s. So this was, you know, before you had computers to play around, you know, all these games with. Nowadays, you get the game of life as a simple program in your machine. Okay, so you can, you can play around with it, look at the various patterns. So what Conway started out was by this. He said that, is it possible to come up with a simple game where you play it on a checkerboard. Every cell on this checkerboard can be in one of two possible states. With tongue firmly in cheek, he said it could be either alive, in which case it's painted black, or it could be dead, in which case it's white. Now, what decides whether a cell will, if it's born, continue to survive or it will die depends upon what its neighboring cells are like. So he gave this very simple few rules. So he said, if you're a live cell and if you have less than two live neighbors, in the next time instant you die. Think of it as death due to loneliness. Okay. If you are a live cell, and if you have more than three live neighbors, then also you die. Think of it as death due to overcrowding. If you have exactly two or three live neighbors, then you survive. We have all heard of two's company, three's crowd, right? So this is two and three's company, Anything else, lesser or greater, is a bad thing. Now, that's about death and survival. But to make things interesting, you also need things to be born. Right? So you need some way in which a dead cell can become live. And so next, Conway proposed the rule by which a cell can be born. So he said, if you have exactly three live neighbors, then in the next time instant, a dead cell which has three live neighbors becomes alive. Sounds very contrived, right? And you might well wonder, what is it all in aid of? So just bear with me. Suppose now you take, and when I was a student, you know, I didn't have access to computers, so you know, when I first encountered this, I just do it in a piece of graph paper. And that's something you can actually do still. But of course, if you are you know, a bit more tech savvy, you might want to do it on your computer. So try this out on a piece of graph paper, which is essentially all dead to begin with. You just put a single live cell. You remember the rules, right? What do you think would be the fate of this single live cell? It will die due to loneliness, correct? Okay. And because there are no other live cells around, you would essentially have nothing else, even if you continue to simulate this for a very long time. Let's take another case. Suppose you have three live cells in a row and nothing else. What do you think will happen? Yes. So, what will happen is in the next time instant, you can figure it out that the cells to the left and right, they only have one live neighbor each, so they will die. The cell in the middle has two live neighbors, so it will survive. Okay? So that tells you about who will survive and who will die. Are there any cells which are going to be born? Look at this 
empty square over here, it has exactly three live neighbors. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a birth. And so it's going to be another birth over here. And so in the next time instant, what you'll have is something like this. Now what do you think will happen at the next time instant? This and this will die, this and this cells will be born, and this will survive. So it will look like this. Now if you notice, this is identical to this. Okay? And so no prizes for guessing that in the next time instant, you'll have this. And so what will happen is you'll have a blinker, something which flips horizontally, vertically, every second time instant as you keep doing the simulations. So things are looking you know, slightly more interesting than you know, simply things dying out. What happens if you have four live cells forming a square? What you notice is that each of the cells has exactly three live neighbors, and so all of them will survive. Will there, will there be any births? Not really, right? Because any of these dead cells at most have only two live neighbors. And so nothing would be born. And so what you have is essentially just the block remaining static forever and ever and ever. So you might wonder at this point that, OK, um, big deal. I mean, you know, presumably this is what Princeton mathematicians do in their spare time. Um, what does this tell us? Now, Conway came up with these rules, and he was lucky that the famous math popularizer, Martin Gardner, got really interested in this game. So he featured this in his famous mathematical games column in Scientific American. So it fascinated a few amateurs mathematicians who kind of read Gardner's column. They started tinkering with it, and very soon, some smart guy realized that you could actually have a set of exactly five live cells, which essentially starts moving across this checkerboard while maintaining the overall configuration. It repeats itself every few iterations, but every time it repeats, it has moved by one diagonal block. Looks exciting, okay? And then Martin Gardner featured this in his column, and lo and behold, some smarter guy came up with this notion that you can create a configuration which creates a glider every few iteration. And with a lack of imagination, they called it the glider gun, right? Now, this really starts looking interesting now, because who would have thought given the rules of life, you know, the rules of survival, the rules of birth, and rules of death, that you could have something which would move across the checkerboard, retaining its configuration, moreover, something which actually could create such structures every few iterations. You have the theory of everything here, and you still can't answer very simple questions like, will such rules actually yield such objects without actually figuring out yourself? without actually doing trial and error. And the icing on the cake is that Conway then took these objects, he took the glider gun, he took the gliders, and he constructed logic circuits. So he said, look, you can actually create and logic gates, or logic gates and not logic gates with these glider guns and gliders. And later on, people proved that you can actually create any computer you can think of using such simple configurations. It has been now been proved that the game of life is capable of universal computation. That is, anything that your laptop can do, the game of life can do, except a lot slower and in a much more complicated fashion. But the point is that given the theory of everything, this is something you would have never been able to figure out ad initio. And that's essentially what is the hallmark of all complex systems. Even if you know the theory of everything, even if you know the rules that govern the individual constituents, there's very little you can say about how the system is going to behave 
from producing those rules themselves. And which I mentioned more is different. That turns out to be the title of a wonderful article written by the physicist Philip Anderson, who essentially used this article to enunciate the property of emergence. This is a word I'll be using throughout my talk. If, if there's one word I want you to take back from this talk, it's this concept of emergence. So what Anderson talked about in this paper that appeared in 1972 is that, look, yes, it's true that everything in the end is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, by the laws of that govern the elementary particles. So if you are a condensed matter physicist, you are essentially looking at how electrons interact with crystal lattices. And of course, electrons obey the fundamental laws of particles. And yet, a property like superconductivity is something that knowing grand unified theory, you wouldn't have been able to predict. Solid state physics isn't just applied particle physics. And he said that this is true for a whole set of sciences. You can always find a science like chemistry whose constituent elements, the molecules, essentially obey the laws of another science. So in the case of chemistry, their fundamental particles obey the laws of many body physics. In the case of molecular biology, their fundamental particles obey the laws of chemistry. In the case of cell biology, the cell itself is made out of molecules, which of course obey the laws of molecular biology. Yet, in none of these cases is this science an applied version of this science. Okay? And he went all the way to say that, look, psychology cannot be reduced to physiology, even if essentially it's just the brain whose activity is making up things like depression, autism, and so on. You do need to understand the laws which kick in at this completely new level. You need new concepts. You need new ways of describing the phenomenon that you see at that level to make any progress. And this principle that at every stage, new principles are coming in is something, of course, which those who are from my era would remember from the movie To Ado Panch. That's essentially what emergence is about. To paraphrase Amitabh Bachchan, ye wo hai jo do or do panch bana de. Okay? The more, the whole is more than a sum of its parts. To give you an example now in concrete terms about how emergence comes about, let me take an example that most of you should be familiar with from your high school physics knowledge. So we've all known about Newtonian mechanics. So essentially, this is behavior that we expect from the interaction between, you know, let's say, one or a few particles. Okay? And the relevant things that we talk about here are the position and the velocity or the momentum of these particles. Now, Given the initial conditions, we can make a fairly good guess as to how the system is going to behave given the Newton's laws of motion, which themselves were built upon Kepler's description of the phenomenological relations that govern the behavior of such particles. Now, you might also be familiar with thermodynamics, okay, which is describing how large objects behave like, like gases, for example. And Vijay has already made my job easier by talking about the dimension, 10 to the power 23 particles. Right? And just to give you an idea of how large 10 to the power 23 is, um, so imagine that uh, you were trying to pack uh, currency notes on a suitcase. Okay. So how, if, so if you're like, you know, trying to pack in, let's say about one crore rupees, okay, 
so which is about um, let's say 5,000 rupees 2,000 notes, right? Now, if I tell you that rupees 2,000 note is just about like one, one gram in weight, you know, that like weighs about like five kg, okay? So, it's like what would go into a briefcase, okay? And so there we are talking about something like a 10 to the power seven currency notes or rather 10 to the power seven, uh, you know, in Indian rupees, not currency notes, I'm sorry, okay? So that weighs about like five kg. And so now we can imagine that I'm, I want to pack in something like, um, let's say one billion rupees. So that would take me something like about 10 suitcases, each weighing 50 kg each, okay? And I've just reached up to 10 to the power nine, right? So imagine how many suitcases you would require to pack something like 10 to the power 23 rupees. Okay? So it's an extremely large number, and that's essentially the number of particles that is going into something of the scale of a macroscopic volume of gas. It's pointless to think about the position and momentum of so many large number of particles and we don't even try. So the physicists who start first, first started working on this thing essentially started describing this in very different terms. They started talking about pressure, volume, and temperature. So just as you know, it's pointless to talk about position and momentum of such a large number of particles, it's pointless to think about the pressure of a single particle or a temperature of a single particle. It just doesn't make sense, right? So these are definitions which make sense only at this macroscopic domain, just as these make sense only in the microscopic domain. And just as Newton came up with his laws, you had the laws proposed by Carnot and Clausius based upon the phenomenological laws given by Boyle. But of course, it's true that the particles which make up the gas do obey essentially the laws of Newton class classical mechanics, except that Newton classical mechanics is not an effective description. Okay. So how do we connect these two very different domains, the domain of the micro world of a single particle and the domain of the macro world of 10 to the power 23 particles? And why do we want to connect them? That's because when you go from the micro domain to the macro domain, you do have emergence of new properties. And one of the most important of them is the arrow of time. So my colleague Rajesh, in the previous Science of the Sabha, already spoke about this. Let me paraphrase just briefly by saying that if I had shown you the domain of the micro world with molecules carrying off each other and showed you the movie backwards, you wouldn't have been able to see the difference. And yet, when I take my cell phone and drop it on this floor and it shatters into a several small pieces, I think we'll all agree that if I'd shown you a movie in which a large number of scattered pieces of a cell phone just spontaneously came together, formed a brand new intact phone and jumped onto my hand, you would immediately know that something is fishy, right? That I'm showing the movie backwards. So what gives you this direction of time, the arrow of time, which makes you able to say that, look, you're just showing me a movie backwards, okay? So why is it that the arrow of time only shows up in the macro world and not in the micro world? So it took the genius of Ludwig Moltzmann and his formulation of statistical mechanics to come up with this answer okay? as to how you have the emergence of the arrow of time as a result of a large number of particles interacting with each other. So the hallmark of all complex systems is essentially this large number of interacting components which essentially produces properties that are very different from that we associate with the individual components. So just to give an example, you could have a crowd whose individual components are, individ you know, human beings, 
Now, each of them is a very you know, sane, rational, law-abiding person. And yet we all know of cases where you bring such people together and they can turn into a very violent mob. So the question we ask is, how is it that interactions essentially result in behavior which is completely different from those of the components appearing at the systems level? And this is very relevant when we are looking at something that Cynthia studies. Okay? So if we want to know or if we want to make sense of how the brain makes up the mind, we need to take help of the science of interactions. Because if you look at the brain, you see that there are many different levels at which we have emergence of novel properties as a result of interaction between components. So you have synapses where essentially large number of molecules interact with each other to allow communication between neurons. You have the neurons themselves, which essentially through many synapses pull information from all the different sensory modalities which are essentially sending signals to the brain. You have the network collating this information, coming up with you know, appropriate action plan, and eventually the central nervous system able to make sense of appropriate stimuli and taking the corresponding response. So you have emergence not just at one level, but multiple levels in a system like the brain. So why is it then that I'm talking about complex system if we already have like domain specialists studying each of the systems in turn? So we have Sandhya studying the brain, we have Harini studying cities, both are complex systems. So why is it that we need a science for complex systems? Okay. Well, we have Goethe who first essentially enunciated the need for a holistic understanding of processes. So in his Faust, he very poetically expressed the need for a new way of looking at systems, which is distinct from the traditional reductionist way of looking at objects. So as he puts it, who traces life and seeks to give descriptions of the things that live, begins with killing to dissect, he gets the pieces to inspect, the lifeless limbs beneath his knife, all parts but link which gave them life. So the reductionist approach is you just take to pieces anything that you wish to understand, you break it down to simple enough pieces that you wish to understand and hopefully you will get to know how the system as a whole works. But the point is that there are many processes where in that process of breaking it down to simple components you lose the very thing that you wish to study. And when you have domain specialists looking at a complex system, when they take it apart, you have essentially something very similar to the parable of the six blind men and the elephant. Each domain specialist looks at his or her favorite gene, molecule, neuron, and says that this is what allows the system to behave the way it does. So, a molecular biologist will look at the brain and say, okay, it's gene P53, which essentially allows the brain to behave that way it does. Somebody else will come up with say, that's nonsense, it's this molecule which makes it the way it does. Right? So you need to step back and make sense of how these different components work together so that you don't miss the forest for the trees. You can see the forest over here, but if, you know, if you peer down and if you look at it, you can get bogged down in the details. It's only by stepping back that you can start making sense of how these parts interlock to create the whole. So how do we do that? As in all sciences, we require models. And in this very spirit of the game of life, we need toy complex systems where we can understand how is it that through coordination of the different parts, you have the behavior emerging, which are very different from those of its components. Now, 
most of you have heard of this kind of story where a mathematician given the job of figuring out the milk production goes into his study, spends a year working count calculations and then finally submits his report. When the interested dairy farmers start looking at his report, they are stumped by the very first line. He starts, the mathematician starts with saying, let us consider a spherical cow. <laughs> so in the spirit of the spherical cow, let us now ask a question, how is it that crowds made out of very well-meaning, well-intentioned people somehow turn out to sometimes have no mind. Okay? The picture I have here is of the recent yellow vest protests in France. And so what we would like to understand is how or what processes eventually lead a crowd of very disparate individuals to turn into violent mob for a brief duration. So what is it that we would like to use in our description. So we have to take the essence of the problem out. So what we focus on the following, that individuals mostly stay in a quiet, what we call the resting state, but occasionally they are driven by circumstances and surrounding to an agitated state for a relatively brief duration. Okay. So now very much like the mathematician, we would reduce this to the following model. So we call this model an excitable system model and it's very easy to essentially get the essential details of such a system. So when I ask what do you mean or what picture do you have in mind when I talk about someone who's excitable, what picture comes to mind? Think about it for a moment. When you say that someone is excitable, what do you have in mind? Someone who very easy to anger, right? Or someone who gets you know, all worked up, often about very minor matters. Okay? So let us start by trying to you know, reduce it to a few set of key descriptive features. So we say, that an element, it could be an individual, it could be something else, either occurs in a resting state or in an excited state. And it goes from a resting to excited state if it is provided stimulation which exceeds a certain threshold. Moreover, after you've excited it, there's a period of time which is like a schooling off period. During that time, if you try to give it an excitation, it won't show you the same behavior. We all know of people who would essentially go off in a you know, jag if you like, you know, give them the slightest provocation. And yet, just after you have agitated them, if you just go and do exactly the same thing, you probably won't see the same response. You have to wait for them to, you know, return back to the so-called resting state before you hope to elicit exactly the same kind of irritation from them. Don't try this at home. So for us, the most important property is, of course, that an element can pass its excitation onto another. And we have seen a wonderful example today when Vijay managed to excite the entire audience. Right? He could pass this excitation on. To the others. Okay. So the more excited neighbors you have, the more likely are you to cross a threshold. And so what do you have? So we have something like the domino effect, okay. where your initial excitation could be passed on to your neighbor, passed on to your neighbors, but this of course depends very much on exactly what your neighborhood is like how strongly are coupled to each other and so on. So for example, you could have this individual getting excited, but its interactions are not strong enough or not dense enough to be passed on to the rest of the audience, to the rest of its neighbors. So essentially it just dies. But 
You could have someone else getting excited, and this person could be well enough connected with strong enough links to its neighbors that it manages to excite or spread its excitation on until the whole crowd essentially goes on to this excited mode. Now, a wonderful example of this is a Mexican wave. So in case you're not familiar with this, the Mexican wave is something that became popular in the, during the 1986 Soccer World Cup that happened in Mexico. It's exactly what the movie says. A section of the stadium suddenly decides to stand up, throw up its hands, and then sit down again. And then this is basically carried on by its neighbors who then throw up their hands and then sit down and so on. And this goes on to the entire stadium. Now, there are wonderful movies on YouTube which essentially shows extremely You're large you know, number of people away. over an entire stadium doing this way. So here is you know, one such example. So you can see how this excitation is basically carried out, carried over from one section of the stadium to the other until the whole thing essentially ripples around the stadium. Now, one of the biggest issues with starting a Mexican wave is to have a critical nucleus going in the first place. Because if you just have a few members of the audience doing this, the others simply will not be enthused enough to take it up. You have to make it you know, appear like that if you are not standing up and waving your hands, you are a party pooper. Right? So, in order to have such an excitation, you need a critical nucleus. And once you have a critical nucleus, you can have such excitations traveling around the system for quite a long while. Now, why is it of interest? Now, you might say Mexican bees may be interesting, but you know, in the larger scheme of things, they are not as important as, let's say, studying Alzheimer's disease, okay? or for that matter, creating new forms of matter. Well, it turns out that systems of excitable elements are all around us. And just two examples that I'll give to you are the brain, because the individual components, neurons, exactly have those excitable properties that I talked about, and the heart, because the muscle cells, the cardiac myocytes, are also excitable. So is it that we see something like the Mexican waves in such organs? Yes. So if you just take the case of the heart, each of these cardiac muscle cells essentially stay most of the time in a resting state, but every few hundred milliseconds, they go into excited state where they become electrically active, and this is important because that's what allows them to contract. And if you have a large number of muscle cells of the heart contract together in a coordinated fashion, you have the heart as a whole contract, which is what allows blood to be pumped to the rest of the body. So how is it that we have electrical wave of activation pass from one cell to the next. So cardiac cells are a bit like bricks. They are essentially connected to the neighbors through specialized proteins known as gap junctions. And these gap junctions are what allows excitation to be propagated from one cell to the next. And so in normal circumstances, you have a wave very much like the Mexican wave pass from one part of the heart to one end of the heart to the end. And as it goes along, it causes a contraction, which is what causes the heart to push blood to the rest of the body. However, occasionally, you have disruptions of the Mexican wave. There are party poopers who, for whatever reason, decide not to take part. And at that point, you have this abnormal objects, the hook-shaped spiral waves, which once they are formed, essentially disrupts the normal rhythmic functioning of the heart. Think back to the Mexican wave analogy. Suppose, for whatever reason, you have certain people in some sections of the stadium who decide to not rise in phase with the rest of the crowd. They are still you know, standing up and waving their hands, but they are doing it at a completely different time. So even though you have people essentially standing up and waving their hands, you know, 
roughly at the same frequency, the fact that you're not doing it in perfect coordination now means that the heart as a whole does not have an overall pumping action and no blood is being pumped to the rest of the body. And if this goes on for a couple of minutes, you're dead. Okay. In fact, it turns out that spiral waves are essentially what leads to a very lethal condition of the heart known as a cardiac arrhythmia. Arrhythmia, as the name itself makes it clear, is a disturbance in the natural rhythm of the heart. So if someone is unfortunate enough to have undergone a heart attack, it's not the heart attack itself which is going to kill this person, but the arrhythmia which might arise as a result of this attack. So this is an ECG trace of an unfortunate individual who went from a normal heart rhythm to a particular kind of arrhythmia known as tachycardia. Tachy, as the name makes it clear, is extremely or abnormally rapid heartbeat. So the ECG does not make it clear, but now if you do a fluorescence imaging of a dog heart which is undergoing tachycardia, you clearly see that what is happening is the onset of such hook-shaped spiral waves. So these spirals are essentially disrupting the normal coordinated rhythmic functioning of the heart, which is what is preventing the heart contracting as a whole, thereby preventing it to function as a blood pump. Now, if we wanted a reason as to why we understand, want to study complex system, this slides provide you one. Now, this looks very complicated, so let me just tell you how to look at it. So this is a summary of a large number of clinical trials done for pharmaceutical drugs which have been developed to counteract arrhythmia. Now, the central line over here that you see is the death threat that you expect from the control group of individuals who were just given a placebo. So typically what happens when you develop a new drug for a disease is that you take two groups of individuals, one of whom is given the medicine and the other is given just a sugar-coated pill, the placebo. And what you would like to know is whether the group which has been given the actual medicine actually shows a significant improvement in their medical condition compared to the control group. So the white line over here is basically giving you the death rate of the control group. What is the probability of someone dying from sudden cardiac death if he or she is not given the medicine which is being tested? So if you're given a beta blocker, for example, it says that your death rate would be reduced to about 80% of what you'd expect if you were not given the medicine. Okay? So that's a bit of an improvement, right? I mean, your death rate was 100%, and if you're given the medicine, it reduces to 80%. So now look at this picture and tell me if there's something wrong with this. So these are all the different kinds of, you know, chemical, pharmaceutical, uh, which were developed, you know, specifically to prevent sudden cardiac death, and they were given to, you know, patients, and then they are essentially trying to figure out what is the death rate for people who are being given this medicine. Anything wrong with this picture? Exactly. Now, if you notice carefully, you will notice that there are two classes of trials in which death was higher in the group which were given the medicine. In one case, it was actually more than twice the rate at which death was happening in the control group. What's going on here? You are being given the medicine to prevent you dying from sudden cardiac death. You don't want to die after being given a medicine which is supposed to cure you out of it, right? So this is a situation which arose because typically pharmaceutical drug development is a reductionist science. 
you are focused on a particular molecule or a particular ion channel and you want to develop a chemical which is going to precisely target that. And in this particular case, what happened was the drug company scientists figured out that, look, one of the big reasons for people having sudden cardiac death is because of rogue cells. Cells which essentially decide to become very active on their own without being told by the natural pacemaker of the heart to excite, they just start getting excited. So in the Mexican wave analogy, these are you know, super excited fans who before the Mexican wave comes around just start waving their hands, okay? thereby disrupting the wave. So what do you do? You just give them a soporific okay? so that they feel too tired to kind of be very active. Now, seems perfectly reasonable. What's the problem? Now, when a wave comes around, these guys are just too tired to take part in the wave and they just want to set it out. Okay? And if a lot of people decide to set it out, the wave gets disrupted and you have essentially a spiral wave or worse, multiple spiral waves occurring in the system, which essentially would result in sudden cardiac death. So this is a cautionary tale about why a reductionist approach sometimes can result in a, what Harini called a wicked answer, okay? a wicked solution. You want to come up with a technological fix, but by focusing too much on the micro details, you come up with an answer which essentially produces more complications which has exactly counterproductive results. So with that cautionary tale in mind, I'd like to end by saying that complex systems is a way of looking at nature which is different from the usual or the traditional reductionist way of looking at processes or systems. We would like to understand how the components essentially work together to create the properties that we associate with the whole. How components which themselves don't have that property essentially upon interactions gives rise to a completely new property at the level of the system. So let me end by um, thanking the giants whose shoulders we have stood upon to understand how complex systems have, how complex systems function, and the legions of students, postdocs, and collaborators with whom we have worked on. And last but not the least, to all of you whose contributions to, as you know, in the form of tax money, is what actually has allowed much of this research to be made not only for you know, understanding how the heart functions, but also on a host of other complex systems, not just in biology, but also in social systems, in physical systems, and others. Thank you. <laughs>